Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, workshop on exploring the future of um, innovation-driven growth and the role of intellectual property, uh, U.S. industry experiences that we are co-organizing um, at the World Intellectual Property Organization with uh, the Intellectual Property Owners Association IPO. My name is Sascha Wunsch, and uh, together with Vanessa Behrens, uh, at my side at WIPO, uh, we will lead you uh, through this event. I will not say much more about the objectives of this workshop, as this will be done by our Assistant Director General, Marco Aleman, uh, who leads the IP and innovation ecosystem sector and oversees our work. Let me just say that we have a rich program um, with a few presentations at the outset and uh, two um, uh, panels, very interesting panels with um, some of the most innovative companies in the United States, uh, such as 3M, DuPont, Google, Teneco, Thermo Scientific, Fisher. So we're very pleased with this. And uh, introductory remarks um, by WIPO, uh, USPTO, and IPO. So without further ado, um, I will pass the floor to our Assistant Director General, uh, Marco Aleman at WIPO, who will introduce um, and welcome you um, to this workshop. Over to you. Uh, many, many thanks, uh, Sasha, for the introduction. And um, let me welcome all of you um, to this um, uh, workshop on exploring the future of innovation driven growth and the role of intellectual property. And in particular, uh, looking forward to have the US industry experiences on this regard. Very pleased with the level of participation and with the number of participants that we are having. And this certainly is thanks to the very close collaboration with our uh, colleagues on the Intellectual Property Owner Associations, IPO, uh, that I would like to thank. And in particular, I would like to thank Jessica uh, Lan Acre, director, Executive Director of IPO. And without any doubt, it's thanks to the very high level participation of the USPDO. And I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Cathy Vidal, and the Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual uh, uh, Property and Director of the USPDO for his, uh, her own uh, very um, important commitment to this event and for the high level participation of USPTO in, in this one. Um, let me go into the goals for uh, the meeting of today. Our main goal is to review with our US-based audience, the results of the 2022 edition of the WIPO Global Innovation Index. And in particular, we would like to revise the team that was developed in, in that um, uh, report. Um, what is the future of innovation-driven growth? That is specific team that had been uh, developed. So we are looking forward for these uh, inputs coming from the US audience on this very particular uh, subject. We are very pleased, as I mentioned before, uh, to have so many US IP professionals and to have so many innovative companies joining us on that session. We are looking forward for your inputs and comments. As many of you already know, uh, we at WIPO publish every year the Global Innovation Index report. Let me say a few words about the report. This report tracks innovation trends and assess the innovation performance of about 132 economies every year. More than a reference guide that probably was at the beginning, the GI has established itself as a powerful tool for the construction of pro-innovation uh, policies all over the world. Indeed, it is at the cornerstone of the tools, manuals, guidance, and all the materials we provide at the WAPO IP and innovation ecosystem sector as a way to engage into conversations on um, innovation uh, worldwide. And we are at the sector very pleased of the positive outcomes. Um, today, what we are going to do is we are going to focus, as I mentioned before, on this theme of the future of innovation-driven growth. This theme, in particular, assess 
the predicted impact of innovation on productivity, economic growth, and societal well being in the coming decades. Despite increased investment in innovation since the 90s, productivity growth, which is often spurred by innovation, has been stagnant for quite a number of years. This is a significant economic and social problem that, without any doubt, is important to be analyzed, studied, and if possible, addressed from the policy point of view. The global innovation in the report of 2022 consider whether this trend, um, what I mean is whether this tendency of stagnation or whether the possibility of revival can be um, um, uh, taken into consideration or whether the stagnation in particular can be reversed and examined about the potential of two innovation wave impact on coming into better and higher level of productivity. These two innovation wave that I mentioned in the, in the report are the digital age innovation wave and the deep science innovation wave. If you go to the report, you will see concrete impact of these two wave in very concrete areas of technology and in very different sector of the industry, many of those participating today. So the GI also identify the main drivers and obstacle of these two ways and propose even some basic, but some policy priorities to maximize their potential. However, something that we have not done in the report is we didn't get into the role of IP in this future innovation wave. There is, um, without any doubt, enough evidence about the important role of IP in the strategies of innovators and in the development of research intensive technology. So without any doubt, it's very important to research, analyze, and study how the IP system and IP rights in particular can play a role in promoting those, these two innovation waves I mentioned before. As you know, IP serve various purposes in the innovation processes, including provided incentives for innovation, facilitating, facilitating learning and knowledge sharing, enabling a specialization and collaboration in global value change and facilitating access to finance. And we have been working in all those fields in different ways at WIPO. But let me go back to the specific question of the, of the seminar today. The question is about the very key role of IP in these future innovation ways, because we have, without any doubt, great deal of hope on how those innovation wave will bring us back into the level of productivity we experienced before. Without further ado, let me pass the floor to Mrs. Cathy Vidal, Director of United States Patent and Trademark Office, and then to Mr. Krish Gupta, Senior Vice President, Litigation and IP, Dell Technologies, and Vice Presidents of IPO. So please, uh, Mrs. Vidal, uh, Mr. Gupta, you have the floor. Thank you, Assistant Director General Marco Aleman. I appreciate your comments. Uh, I also wanna thank WIPO and IPO for this important workshop. I'm actually coming to you from Naples, Florida, where we are hosting one of our women entrepreneurship events. And that event and that series has the same goals in mind as you are discussing, that we need to drive more growth and productivity through innovation. And we see IP as the bridge between innovation and actually bringing products to market and world problem solving. So I'm very delighted to join you all here today. I congratulate WIPO on the publication of this year's Global Innovation Index, the GI 2022. What an impressive undertaking and the results are so valuable. As we all know, technology and innovation in the public and private sectors are essential in solving the world's most vexing problems. The GI 2022 provides helpful insights into the state of the innovation ecosystem throughout the world. This year's report shows the US climbing to the number two position in global innovative economy ranking, while Switzerland held on to the number one spot for the 12th year. Even though the US is a global leader in innovation, we will only realize our full potential 
once we have equal access to the innovation and intellectual property ecosystem by all Americans. By bringing all Americans off the bench, we can create more jobs, bolster economic prosperity and solve world problems. Data shows that if we can quadruple the number of inventors in America, we can grow our economy by $1 trillion. This is not just an opportunity we are embracing in America. I know it is an opportunity that many countries are embracing. Indeed, at our Trilat meetings in North Carolina a couple months ago with Europe and Japan and WIPO and industry groups like IPO, thank you both, this was our focus. In the G7 IP meetings, this was our focus. Moving forward, this will be our focus. We are focused on achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals through increasing innovation, protecting more innovation, and bringing that innovation to market. The updated GI 2022 is a crucial tool to help us understand the extent to which underrepresented groups participate in the innovation ecosystem. Looking at the GI 2022 subcomponents, it shows the US ranked first in market sophistication, third in knowledge and technology outputs and in business sophistication, and ninth in human capital and research. US industries using at least one form of IP intensively accounted for 41% of all US economic activity over the past decade. And workers in these IP intensive industries receive higher earnings than workers in other industries. Yet given the recent experience in the US over the past decade, we at the USPTO and within the Department of Congress share Assistant Director General Aleman's concerns about lower productivity, productivity growth. We also share his optimism. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, annual labor productivity growth in the US has averaged 2.1% since the end of World War II. But between 2011 and 2018, labor productivity growth never exceeded 1.5% and was often under 1%. I'm having a technical issue on this end. Hold on one second. <laughs> Innovation in the information and com communication technologies, ICT spaces, and in areas such as biotechnology, nanotechnology, materials, and clean energy production and distribution may spur greater pr productivity growth over the next decade. For example, the last prolonged period of above average productivity growth in the US between 1996 and 2004 coincided with the crest of the first ICT or digital age wave. In addition, innovation and patenting in these areas remain robust through the COVID pandemic era. If anything, the pandemic may have even accelerated innovation in these areas, especially in healthcare, where mRNA technologies offer new promise for treatments and cures, and communications technology, where systems facilitated offsite work. And in previous rounds of innovation, IP rights played an important role, allowing for innovators to obtain funding and bring their ideas to market, and for others to build upon those innovations. In areas such as ICT and artificial intelligence, innovation can spur economy-wide productivity increases, provided firms can access and use those innovations. IP rights are a fundamental part of this solution. And as Assistant Director General Aleman alluded, there are obstacles to the adoption of new technologies that may spur productivity growth. I look forward to hearing from the participants today on how to facilitate the adoption of worldwide new technologies and what role IP and the IP ecosystem can play in this process. By utilizing tools like the GI 2022 and workshops like this, we can continue to foster inclusive innovation to solve the world's most pressing problems and ultimately improve lives, lives globally. Thank you. Hello, I'm Krish Gupta, a Senior Vice President for Litigation and Intellectual Property for Dell Technologies. And I'm very pleased to be here to provide introductory remarks on behalf of the Intellectual Property Owners Association, which I serve as Vice President. 
First, thank you to Assistant Director General Alman and Director Vidal for your wonderful remarks. IPO appreciates your participation in today's event, as well as your many efforts to help facilitate a better understanding of the IP ecosystem. For background, IPO is an international trade association representing a big tent of diverse companies, law firms, service providers, and individuals in all industries and fields of technology. Our membership includes over 125 companies and spans over 30 countries. Our vision is the global acceleration of innovation, creativity, and investment necessary to improve lives. IPO has adopted a strategic objective to foster diverse engagement in the innovation ecosystem and to integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion in all its work. This complements IPO's mission of promoting high quality and enforceable IP rights and predictable, predictable legal systems for all industries and technologies. We believe that inclusive innovation and innovation-driven growth go hand in hand. Providing education about the IP system is a top priority for IPO. We do this among other ways through hosting and co-hosting events, providing speakers, and through the work of the IPO Education Foundation. Uh, IPO would like to thank the World Intellectual Property Organization for organizing this event with IPO. We would also like to congratulate WIPO on the publishing of its 2022 Global Innovation Index. We believe that the Global Innov Innovation Index is insightful. We welcome its examination of an upcoming digital age innovation wave and a, and a deep science innovation wave. These innovation waves are critical and crucial to meeting the global challenges that the world faces. We're pleased to be able to participate in this event to share the experiences of our members regarding the relationship between IP and innovation. And we believe that today's presentations will be extremely informative about how the IP system is utilized to facilitate innovation and partnerships, specifically in industries related to those two waves. Events like this, coupling economic studies with practical experiences of innovators can enable a better understanding of the intellectual property system and how it can help us improve lives. We look forward to this discussion and to continuing to find ways to educate the public about the IPU ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you for those opening remarks. Um, we will now be hearing a 15 minute presentation that will take us through uh, what the uh, two innovation waves are precisely and how we expect uh, growth to be driven by innovation in the future. So with this, I would like to pass the floor to Klaas de Vries, um, Senior Economist at the Conference Board, who has been working closely with WIPO and especially with Sasha Ronchvansan um, on precisely this topic that has uh, made uh, the, the thematic focus of the GII 2022. Over to you. Thank you um, very much, um, Vanessa. And um, as the introductions have alluded to, um, from a strictly economic point of view, um, we are in a relatively critical uh, situation with respect to productivity. Um, and so the, the goal of the GII was really to uh, understand uh, what the current declining productive figures are about and how we possibly can get out of this. And uh, so a class and I will take you to through the main topics covered in the GII. The first, uh, you know, what really is the significance of productivity? It sounds a little bit like a technical thing that is not uh, not so important, maybe, but it's really critical to improving standards of living across the world. And um, as Mrs. Vidal has, you know, underlined, uh, without this, our standards of living would be very different, right? If in the 19th and 20th century, the growth would have been different. We will underline the and explain the the productivity decline uh, with class, and then maybe um, say a few words about the role of governments in in getting out of this. 
So without further ado, I pass the floor to, to Klaas, who will tell us a little bit about the centrality of productivity uh, across time and what's happening now. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Sasha. So yeah, just to, to dive right in, I think the first fact is you know, just to note that you know, societies grow richer by utilizing their resources more efficiently uh, and not so much by utilizing just simply more resources. So for example, capital and labor. Now, of course, most economies nowadays, they do utilize more labor than they did, uh, let's say a hundred years ago. But the overall increase in living standards or economic growth uh, over that period has been uh, far greater, basically. And then we tried to show that in that chart here, which is really showing a long uh, time span, basically data from the Middle Ages onwards. And the fact here is that, you know, for most of human history, uh, we've actually seen very little or no growth in, uh, in living standards. But this really only started to change uh, with the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s when we started to get on this uh, fast uh, growth, uh, economic growth and productivity growth spurt. Now, Sashi, if we can move to the next slide where we zoom in a little bit, because this is really a very long time period. If we zoom in over the last 150 years and simply just looking at the productivity trend growth rates of the major global economies, we noticed that something strange has happened. And that is that uh, really that productivity growth has started to slow down since the 1970s. Uh, and in some places it even started to stagnate. And overall, this is very much true for uh, high income economies, or at least those economies that have seen quite a bit of a productivity spurt in earlier uh, decades. Uh, but to some extent, we've also seen this in emerging economies. Uh, uh, for example, China, even though you know the growth rates are still at a very high level, but we've started to see them leveling off in those economies too. Now, uh, just very briefly on you know some of the the leading hypotheses that have been sort of brought forward to explain the slowdown. I think there are three main buckets. The first it has to do with just the fact that uh, ideas are getting harder or certainly more costly to find. So you could say, you know, we picked all the low hanging fruit. And furthermore, the ideas that do come to fruition, they seem to be less disruptive or less transformative than those of previous eras. Again, this is the, you know, this is the line of argumentation. The second line relates to, at least some argue that the inno uh, innovation process is broken or at least it doesn't work as well uh, as, it, as it did in the past. So for example, many companies nowadays, they outsource their R&D instead of doing it in-house. So that could mean that the, the link between the laboratory and the, uh, and the marketplace has sort of weakened. And then finally, the third uh, uh, line of argumentation relates to the headwinds, so-called headwinds. That means that you know even if we had good productivity growth, it's making less of an impact nowadays uh, because a lot of you know resources are either diverted to sort of non-productive uses such as paying off ever higher debt loads, or think about increasing environmental uh, regulations, or even uh, maybe they're simply not reaching a large part of the population uh, due to rising inequality. Now in the next slide, as you can see here, we. Uh, we zoom in a little bit further. This is basically the post uh, Second World War period. And uh, what you can see here is how the growth in per capita income trend lines have sort of become flatter over time. So you can see, you know, in every sort of couple of decades, the trend line has become flatter and you can see how these gaps have started to emerge, uh, basically relating to, you know, what, uh, where income levels could have been uh, had the previous trend continued and we continually seem to be moving to a slower trend line. And to the right, very briefly, that's just a short, really short term, the last 10 years, global productivity growth rate, uh, basically are, you know, it's showing that over the last years, the dynamics haven't really gotten better. So we had a boost in 2020, but overall uh, this uh, in, in 2021 and also the first figures for 22 suggest uh, stagnation in global productivity growth. Now, before I hand it over to Sasha to talk a little bit about the two waves, uh, I think it's important to make a number of distinctions. The first relates to the differences between firms. So we have frontier firms, lagging firms, 
uh, that that has always been the case, but it seems to be that the distance between those two is getting bigger. So a lot of frontier firms are doing just fine, but it, it, there seems to be trouble with uh, adoption and diffusion. The same seems to be true if you sort of divide the economy into different sectors. That's what you can see on this slide. There's a number of sectors across countries that seem to be doing consistently better in terms of productivity growth than, than other sectors. But you could say the same thing about regions within uh, economies. So we've also seen increasing uh, divergence. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that any potential revival that we that we want to see, again, Sasha will explain to, uh, in a minute, they will have to address these uh, these distinctions that I that I just uh, uh, explained. So Sasha, uh, over to you. Thank you, Klaas. So um, in the chapter, obviously, we then ask um, whether there will be a productivity revival, right? So there is um, consensus um, among innovation economists and, and productivity economists that only a future or several future innovation waves can really lift uh, productivity up again to uh, higher levels uh, on par with uh, innovation waves that we experienced in the 19th and the 20th century. And there's essentially two camps here. Um, one camp uh, full of pessimists who actually see that we will remain um, in a period of great stagnation, that it will be very hard to find uh, technologies on par with what we had in the 19th and 20th century. And then uh, a camp of um, innovation optimists uh, who feel that we are um, on the cusp uh, of something uh, big and great that could, uh, that could help us out um, on the productivity front. Now, in the GII and at WIPO, uh, we put ourselves in the in the optimists camp, um, at least so far, um, and um, we um, sketch the possibility of um, the rise of two upcoming innovation waves. Uh, we call them the digital age wave and the deep science wave, and those will be the two waves also that will form uh, the center of the discussion of, of the panels that will ensue. The digital age wave uh, really came in two phases. Um, of course, the internet or information communication technologies are nothing new. So we admit that um, installation of um, networks and computers has actually been ongoing uh, since the late 1970s, right? So this is not new. However, the expected productivity impacts um, were relatively low, you know, surprisingly low to economists, just a small, uh, revival in the United States, essentially, but uh, nothing much in, in other countries. So a great disappointment there. Now, we speculate that this is because um, it's the use of those ICTs that really drives uh, productivity increases across sectors, and not just any use, but the use of very much more advanced uh, ICT solutions that we're starting really to experience in the last few weeks, right? Uh, there's a lot of uh, new hype on AI, and we actually see how these things can actually matter uh, for, the, for productivity impacts across sectors. Sectors is important because as class has shown, many sectors have been in low productivity scenario uh, for a while now. Very key sectors like health, uh, education, a government, right? And so we um, suspect and we speculate that in this digital age wave, many services sectors or sectors which haven't benefited from productivity increases will be impacted positively uh, by advanced ICT solutions. The second wave uh, we call the deep science wave. Again, it's, uh, it stands on the shoulder of giants of, of previous uh, scientific breakthroughs and discoveries in the fields of bio, nano, and, and, and health uh, technologies over the last two decades. Uh, so we've seen a lot of uh, breakthroughs in these fields in the last two decades, but never any wide-scale application throughout the economy with productivity impacts. Um, and we feel, uh, not only with vaccines, but many other things that are ongoing now, that finally um, we will see application um, of those uh, technologies across sectors of the economy with productivity revival ensuing. It's a little bit more difficult in this field because obviously uh, measuring productivity is much easier in a factory or, or, or you know, in a company than it is um, uh, in the health sector, right? How do you properly measure the productivity impact of, of vaccines and so forth? Nonetheless, this um, 
deep science wave that is um, the subject of discussion of the second panel will trigger uh, major changes in life sciences, in, in food, in energy and mobility that are explained in much greater detail uh, in the chapter. So let's conclude uh, maybe with uh, a final point on policy and business solutions by class, and then start uh, panel number one. Thanks, Sasha. So yeah, that all sounds very exciting, but I guess the question here is, you know, what's the role that policy has to play in this? Now, uh, obviously the future is uncertain and it's very hard to predict, uh, but we think that given the current and the ongoing technological opportunities, we think that government policy certainly has a role in ensuring that these, uh, these opportunities are realized. And this can happen, for example, through uh, the funding of basic and more applied research in promising fields. Um, and perhaps, well, perhaps one of the most important ones is facilitating a more fluid uh, tech transfer and adoption uh, throughout, you know, throughout the, throughout the economy. So think about necessary complementary infrastructure, for example. And uh, finally, related to that, you know, addressing the inequalities that exist at the firm, region, and uh, country levels, or at least make sure that they don't uh, widen further. Now, there's more listed on this slide. We don't really have time to go through all of them now, but let me end on this uh, final note because we also think that you know the existing productivity metrics, they may also need a bit of a rethink, perhaps, or maybe more broadly, the, the current way of how we're measuring innovation impacts and outcomes, because it seems that there's uh, more and more focus on uh, well-being. Uh, think about health or the environment. You know, Sasha mentioned a couple in this uh, uh, deep science wave. And a number of these things, they do not necessarily accord uh, very well with the established macroeconomic productivity concepts. So I guess in other words, we may also uh, be in need of some innovation in the way that we measure innovation. Now with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. And now uh, let me hand it back to uh, the, the panel in, uh, in, in the WIPO room in Geneva. Thank you so much for those insights. We will now start the first panel um, session that is dedicated to the digital age uh, wave and we will hear from three panelists who are experts in intellectual property if you have any questions during or after um, the panel feel free to use the Q&A function we will try to answer as many of them as we can then uh, yeah the session will be chaired by uh, Lisa Jorgensen our deputy director general leading the patents and technology sector at WIPO Lisa, over to you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Welcome to the first panel discussion on the digital age innovation wave and the role of IP. Now, as we heard in the previous presentation and in Marco's welcome address, the digital age innovation wave characterized by the widespread adoption of advanced information and communication technologies or ICT across all sectors and areas of life is one of the two potential future innovation waves that could have a significant impact on our future. The Global Innovation Index acknowledges that the use of ICT as a driving force is not a new phenomenon. The first surge in ICT adoption, which led to the development of sophisticated communication networks and equipment such as the internet and mobile devices began in the 1970s. However, the GII predicts that a second surge in ICT adoption is imminent. As ICTs evolve into general purpose, digital technologies, including supercomputing, cloud computing, the internet of things, artificial intelligence and automation, driving the emergence of the new digital economy. In this digital age wave, the impact of ICTs unfolds in two ways. The first way is ICT is a research tool. ICTs have had a powerful impact on scientific advances and research and development in fields such as bioinformatics, pharmaceuticals, green technology, and other scientific fields. The ability to analyze and simulate data using ICTs has greatly influenced the innovation process and the organization of R&D. 
The second way is advanced ICTs to drive productivity across all economic sectors. The second ICT revolution will profoundly impact the organization and productivity of all manufacturing and service sectors, including education, transport, and government services. Together, the development and implementation of advanced digital technologies will enable people and machines to have entirely new capabilities. This panel will explore how the new, how the next digital wave, digital age wave, characterized by technologies such as supercomputing, AI, large-scale digitalization, 3D printing, and advanced robotics, will impact the role of IP. What new opportunities and challenges will emerge? It is undeniable that IP has always played a critical role in the ICT industry. The most successful ICT firms have consistently made use of very form, various forms of IP, including patents, design, and branding. According to the WIPO World IP Indicators Report 2022, 10% of patent applications published globally in 2020 were in the field of computer technology, the largest IP technology field. Other strong ICT related fields include electrical machinery, measurement, digital communication, and medical technology, which together accounted for approximately one third of all published applications globally in 2020. Additionally, WIPO studies have demonstrated the important role of IP and intangible assets in driving firm value. For example, a WIPO study on smartphones showed how technology, design, and branding are combined by the most successful firms to secure the largest market value shares. Looking to the future, the question for this panel is how future digital age innovation will impact the role of IP. So now for our panelists, their CVs are in the chat room, so I will just briefly introduce them to you now. First is Laura Sheridan. Laura is the head of patent policy at Google. She has, she has been a key participant in Google's global patent policy efforts for over 10 years, taking the lead in 2020. Next is Brett Allen. Brett is the Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel, Chief IP Counsel at Hewlett, Hewlett Packard Enterprise in Palo Alto. And, and third is Mr. Jason Reyes. Jason is the Vice President Intellectual Property for Dell, and he leads, leads teams with global responsibility for providing legal support for and developing the company's IP policies. So let me um, start with the first question. Um, and Laura, I'll start with you. Can you tell us what the digital age wave means to you and your business? And following that, what areas of technology and our policies are part of the digital age innovation wave? Laura, to you. Sure, thank you so much. Um, and I'm really, really happy to be here. This has been a wonderful event so far. Um, so you mentioned in your opening remarks um, that the development and implementation of advanced digital technologies will enable people and machines to have entirely new capabilities. Um, and that is something that I strongly agree with. And I think um, AI technology is one of the primary places we will see this growth with continued access to AI technology for application in areas that haven't benefited from it yet. Uh, you can see some of these applications in Google's own work with AI. We've created better flood forecasting models and we're transmitting early flood warnings based on the model's predictions. And in 2021, we sent out 115 million flood warning alerts using these models. We're also using satellite imagery to create AI models that can detect wildfire boundaries in real time, show their location on search and maps. And in 2022, we used this in more than 30 wildfires in the US and Canada, which helped inform residents and firefighters. And we're expanding this capability out to Mexico and parts of Australia as well. So I am a real optimist about digital innovations and the positive impact they can have. And you're also seeing governments invest in helping researchers access and build on this innovation 
so that even more entities can make use of it in their products and services. Now, another strong area of growth in digital technologies is the increase in connectedness in ways we simply didn't have just 10 years ago. So much of our homes, our cars, our cities, and our factories are interconnected, and they're able to wirelessly uh, communicate. And this has allowed for you know, control of your home's HVAC system through your smartphone and monitoring a factory's production through sensors. And this growth is only going to continue as products implement communication technologies for interoperability. And finally, I have to briefly mention quantum computing. Now, while this is in an earlier stage of growth, its potential is real. And I think you'll continue to see private sector and government investment similar to what we're seeing in AI that help make it more accessible and grow this area even faster. Thank you, Laura. So you're the optimist with uh, government support and increased connectedness. Let's move to Brett and ask Brett you the same thing. What does digital age wave mean to you in your business? And, and uh, what areas of technology and our policies are part of that? So Brett, over to you. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a great conference so far, I agree. Um, you know, uh, I, I am also an optimist before I get started. I have to agree with Laura and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why in a second. I think um, the definition of, well, obviously innovation and, and uh, IP has a very strong nexus, but I also think it's, as I think the earlier speakers mentioned, it's very difficult to tease out that linkage and the causality, although it's clear that it exists. I, so I think the question that was raised earlier about whether innovation metrics need to be sort of uh, reevaluated or sort of at least reconsidered makes, makes sense, but they're almost certainly very closely linked. And I would say uh, the reason I'm strongly an optimist is what I'm seeing is that those two waves, uh, whether it's the digital uh, sort of innovation wave or this uh, sort of subsequent um, deep science wave are getting more and more linked together and the synergies are beginning to play uh, on themselves. So, as we see these strong sort of enabling technologies developed, we're seeing the applications develop, which and then in turn enables greater fundamental uh, enabling technologies to develop. So that synergy that I'm seeing uh, happen also as a result of better communications and things like quantum computing, AI, ML, all those things, they are just uh, building off on themselves. Um, so I would fully agree with everything that was that was said to date. Um, one of the areas that I would mention right up front is this uh, the importance of supercomputing, which you know HPE is is very involved in when we we acquired Craig supercomputing some years ago, and we recently launched the most powerful supercomputer you know in the world. And this is obviously doing all kinds of things that will not only enable sort of those uh, deep science innovations, but it's actually enabling uh, more fundamental enabling technologies by applying these, these supercomputing uh, resources. Um, so I think what we're seeing, you know, just to sort of summarize, is a virtuous cycle between the two waves. I don't think they're going to be, uh, I think they're gonna become less and less distinct. And um, I suspect that distributed ledgers like you know, blockchain, uh, quantum computing, fully agree, AI, ML, super likely to transform and speed up innovation and have a very large impact uh, going forward. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but in general, uh, fully, very, very much an optimist. Thanks, Brett. Um, so now we have two optimists. Uh, you also talked about uh, additional links and synergies, uh, sort of the strong enabling technology with the follow-on applications. So let's let's move to Jason and ask Jason if you could talk to us about the same uh, area 
what does digital age wave mean to you and your business? And uh, what areas of technology and our policies are part of that digital age innovation? So Jason. Yeah, yeah thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, and you know, also glad to be here. And I guess I would make it unanimous in terms of being an optimist. Um, because I, I really, you know, I, I think of all the areas that we've talked about, um, I would probably focus in sort of in the short term, mainly in the areas of AI and ML, um, just because I think they really they really have demonstrated already um, the the enormous potential there to to uh, you know kind of transform things and really increase productivity. Um, you know, I think there's been as everybody's probably aware, there's been a lot of buzz lately uh, because of Chat uh, GPT um, and and the um, OpenAI organization. Um, and even headlines about how there's a there's a um, you know huge valuation already for that organization, whether it's whether it's real um, or not, of, of something like thirty billion dollars. Um, so I, I think there's real potential given the level of computation that's available now and the level of storage that's available now, and the way that um, those two things can be linked, and um, and the way that uh, AI and ML engines can be uh, benefited from from those links, I think there's tr tremendous uh, uh, opportunities for, for innovation there. Um, you can certainly see this already in, like it, when it comes to like Dell, for example, in, in the areas of certainly storage and compute, but also just in product design, um, content creation, um, security, um, you, you see the benefits of these technologies already. So I think that, um, you know, especially if we have the right kinds of uh, 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 policies in place, both both at sort of a corporate level and at a government level, to encourage uh, this kind of innovation. Um, I think we could see uh, there's a real opportunity to see tremendous uh, productivity growth there. Thanks, Jason. So we have three optimists. Let's. Um, you you each talked about sort of the technology and and the policies behind it for you and your companies. L let me start. Uh, with you, Brett, on the second question. So what then is the role of IP in, in this unleashing of this digital age wave? Is it business as usual or something novel? And, and in this potentially new environment, what, what's the role of IP or has the role of IP changed the way your companies view innovation? Yeah, so um, I, I think intellectual property is... Our, our reliance on intellectual property is changing. At least, you know, HPE and HP before that was a largely a hardware company. And as we see this transition more and more to software technologies, there are fewer needs uh, to sort of publish your, your, uh, your innovations through patents. I think there's going to be a continuing role for patents. I think you can see over the last 30, 35 years, the number of software patents that are issued by the US Patent Office has roughly increased by 1% per year, despite some of the eligibility challenges that we've seen, like that were obvious through Alice and other, other software cases. So I, I'm not saying that patents will not play an important role. I, I think they will, but I think uh, for me, and what I've seen is the importance of trade secrets emerging as not only uh, a new way to claim proprietary rights in this industry, but actually a way that's going to uh, create the, uh, the foundation for strong collaboration and partnerships through technology transfer sort of arrangements. To me, that's probably where the future, at least the short-term future is moving. Naked IP assertions uh, have gotten a bad rap. I think there's a, a role for them as well. But I think when you have voluntary agreements uh, between two companies who want to accelerate their business plans by sharing information uh, confidentially, you can really uh, you can really move things uh, more quickly. So trade secrets, just to summarize, is, is I think increasingly important. And the other piece that is almost, you know, uh, sort of 
counterintuitive is the open source and open data movements, which I think are increasingly important as well. And they play very well together. They're not, uh, it, it's not a choice. I think in fact, you know, open source are the building blocks of common platforms that accelerate large numbers of, of people and, and large, you know, lots of entities but it's the differentiable technologies that layer on top of that, that are usually gonna be held by either patented technology or through trade secrets. So, uh, so I think if you look at it as a two layer stack where you've got open, large collaborative building blocks, and then on top of that, these differentiated rights that can sort of enable collaboration in a safe way. I, th I think you actually get more, uh, more speed, uh, more innovation, more collaboration. And I think uh, it's, it's a good thing. Thanks, Brett. So as you've mentioned, moving or, or more software patents are still gonna be very important, but we'll have, we'll see much more emerging in the area of trade secrets, which, could then benefit partnerships and, and the voluntary uh, agreements between two companies. And I'd like to come back to that in, in a further question because I think this could be very important to, to this area. Um, let me move to Jason. Um, tell us you know, what, what you see as the role of IP in unleashing the digital age wave. Uh, again, business as usual or something novel and, and has the role of IP changed the way your company views innovation? Certainly. So I think, um, you know, I think as, as Brett was mentioning, I think finding, number one, I think finding the right balance between open and closed is very important. And I'm not sure that that, that balance has been, has been found or, or settled on uh, yet exactly. Um, but, but I think it's very important to look at concepts like open source and open data in this area. But also, I think it is very important to make sure that, um, companies and, and, and others are able to protect their investments in, in these areas. Um, and so I think pat, patent protection, um, the right kind of patent protection is very important. Um, and in that area, I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there about um, protecting um, IP and inventions, especially, um, especially in the areas of AI and ML. Um, you know, I think you see in even headlines now still some um, some stories about uh, uh, people trying to submit patent applications with with AI as a, as an inventor, and I think you know that, that's some of the misconceptions there. I think there are it will be important to focus on you know proper ways of approaching uh, patent protection and in in claiming uh, uh, around inventions in in the AI and, and AI and ML areas, and there are ways to do that that I think. Um, both both the patent offices you know around the world and patent practitioners will need to be aware of to make sure that um, that these inventions are protected properly. And, and I think you know once you have that, and then I think you're able to set up a, an open versus closed kind of framework more easily since you have more control over the technology there and how it's how it's used. Um, the, the one other area I wanted to mention in this is is in the area of, of copyright protection. Um, you know, especially in the area of AI, um, there are questions being raised now about how do you make sure that um, that licenses around uh, things like data and code are, are being complied with when they're being used as inputs into AI engines? Um, and and how, how do you make sure that you don't have uh, improper copyright infringement in the outputs of these of these uh, systems? Um, so I think there will need to be some some analysis of copyright protection as well um, as we move forward in, in, uh, in this way. Thanks, Jason. Uh, you know, the right balance between open and closed and then the role of IP. Uh, I take your point that patent protection is, is a, going to be um, a, a function of being able to claim it properly and adequately and even adding in areas like copyright where Brett had also brought up the area of trade secrets as part of the, the future in IP. So Laura, let me turn it over to you to ask the same question. Uh, the role of IP in unleashing the digital, digital age wave, business as usual or something novel and what the role of IP and has it changed the way your, companies, your company views innovation? 
Thanks. So on the first half of the question, I think given the growth in areas like AI and communication technologies, um, IP does have the potential to play a novel role in further accelerating that growth so that its impact can be brought about even sooner. Um, and as for the role of IP impacting our view of innovation, I'd say things have certainly gotten um, more complex. And I'm going to agree with you know, much of what Brett and Jason have been talking about already. Uh, so first, um, let's look at AI. Uh, it's an area that is and will continue to see tremendous, tremendous growth, both for the creation of new models uh, and the application of those in products and services. And along with the growth in investment in this area, there's also been a real growth in AI patenting. Uh, Google's actually one of the largest patent holders in this area. And I wanna echo what Jason talked about in terms of really understanding how to go about um, patenting in AI um, and really understanding where your invention fits within um, the broader AI structure, whether it's core AI and application of AI and how you really can successfully go about um, patenting that. Um, because we have found, you know, it is something you need to really understand um, what sorts of inventions you yes. can obtain and, and how to go about doing so. Um, but certainly patenting is, is something that is tremendously growing in this space as well. Um, but as Brett mentioned, AI is just a really interesting technology area because even with this growth in patenting, um, it's really a culture of openness. Um, the researchers in AI come from academia. There is um, an emphasis on sharing, and that's all about increasing the speed of innovation in this space. So openness is hugely important here, um, but patenting and this open, open sourcing, they seem like they'd be in tension, but I think as Brett mentioned, and as we've experienced as well, they really aren't. And you're going to see continued growth in patenting, while at the same time, you'll see continued growth in and open sourcing of this technology, those will continue to coexist. But I think at the same time, and also as Brett mentioned, um, there's a growing importance of trade secrets in AI. Um, so we do patent in AI significantly, um, but trade secret protection is a critically important tool here as well, particularly with respect to the weights that are being used um, in these models. And so I think companies like Google and others in this space um, we all need to make sure we're adequately protecting these trade secrets, um, which, you know, I think looking back 10 years ago, I don't think companies were as necessarily adept in this and now have really learned along the way um, the importance of doing so and, and how to do so. So I think that will only continue to be something that in parallel with open sourcing and patenting continues to grow in importance. Thanks, Laura. So as uh, Jason mentioned, uh, the, the patenting is still important um, and trade secrets. You've, you've brought in another sort of element to this too, I think, when you talk about the open source, which is potentially changing the culture of, of the workforce or changing the culture of how we manage things in, in the open type atmosphere. So I think that's can will we'll take, take us into the third question. Um, to follow on from what I think Brett was saying earlier, each of your companies works with partners around your industry, around some of your related industries. Has Have IP and financing models and or licensing models changed as a result of this digital age innovation wave? And this time, let's start with Jason. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question that I think you know, I'll just sort of speak on on behalf of what I've seen at Dell. I, I've really seen a, a a pretty big change, I'd say, over the past several years. I think where Dell was was much more focused on kind of um, in the open versus closed kind of spectrum, more and more on the closed end, and much and has now become much more interested in things like open source and and even in terms of contributing to open source and contributing in and um, helping to develop standards um, for helping to uh, interact with, with other technologies. Um, so, you know, I think those are two of the big areas where I've seen a, a change um, because of the way that the technology is developing. And then, um, and, and Brett can relate to this as well, you know, there's also a big change now in terms of the way um, Dell's products are sold. Um, it's, it's uh, we, we're looking much more of a sort of subscription kind of uh, uh, setup, 
And this is really kind of taking uh, a hold all the way across the industry. And I think it's not a it's not a coincidence that this is happening at the same time that these innovations are happening because um, it's very important to be able to use um, these technologies um, to be flexible in the way these technologies are used and also to make sure that these technologies are being used efficiently. And I think the sort of the old ways um, of of owning these uh, these products perhaps we're not quite as quite as flexible um, as as we have now. So th those I think are the ways that it's it's impacted the most, at least from from Dell's perspective. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if, it, if they heard my question. Um, I may have forgotten to turn on my, my button. So let me ask it again, and, and let's turn it over to Laura this time. Um, Google works with a lot of partners in your industry. So have the IP and financing models and or the licensing models changed as a result of the digital age innovation wave? Laura, over to you. Thanks. So I, I'd say they've certainly have gotten um, more complex uh, along the lines of, you know, the, the changes Jason's talking about. For, for us, the way it plays out is um, in the AI space in particular, you know, we're regularly entering into partnerships where we provide our models and cloud resources to an enterprise partner who will then bring in their training data sets and um, evaluate the results for their own purposes. And in this kind of partnership, it's really important that there's a good understanding of who owns what and who has the rights to do what. Um, and from the outset, that there's, there's total clarity on that. And for us, um, the way it's typically structured is, of course, we own our background IP and the models that we've, um, we're letting, having the, the customer use and train their, with their data. Um, but if there are modifications made to that, we wanna be able to use those too. But any output, of course, from the model would be owned by the customer. So you know, this is something that as we've entered into these relationships more and more, we've, we've developed a better understanding of you know, how to make sure this is very clear from the outset so that everybody has this understanding um, at, the, at the start of the engagement. Thanks, Laura. Um, I, I think that's interesting in terms of the, the uh, who owns what, the background IP, the, the output of, of the model. Um, for example, your data set. So, um, Brett, let's ask you the same question then. Uh, the partnerships that you, uh, your company enters into, have the IP and financing models and or the licensing models changed? Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I can't speak too much to the financing models. I don't know if I've seen much change there. Uh, although I would say that the licensing has evolved a bit. Uh, again, going back to that earlier point, um, I, I think what's happening is you're seeing an increasingly large common and open set of technologies below with more selective sort of differentiation above. So that means that uh, you're going in order to be successful, if you wanna leverage AI technologies or, or uh, ultimately you need large data sets to fuel those AI technologies, you need very open sort of fundamentals, which also attracts some of the best and brightest sort of uh, engineers uh, from academics and as, as well as from industry. So there's a real commitment to that open culture. Um, and I think that's been there for a very long time. But I think um, what we're seeing is a more balanced approach to the use of, of open source, which sort of transitioned and became you know, omnipresent over the last 20 years to a more, you know, uh, fundamental component of every piece of software. I think it's in 90 to 95% of all commercial software now. And now we're seeing exactly the same thing with open data models, especially when you're talking about for societal good, because um, 
you 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 just you absolutely must have large trained data sets in order to sort of leverage your AI. And I do think there's a new wave of artificial data that's fueling AI technologies as well. So you're not gonna rely on natural data quite as much, but I still think sharing of data is now fundamental in our licensing models so that we can actually move faster, bring new technologies that can benefit more, more uh, customers ultimately. So hopefully that, that answered your question, Lisa. Yes, I think it does. And I think we're seeing a theme here of open source, open data, uh, what you called open fundamentals. Um, so let's move to the last question. Um, and if we can, we'll try to make time for some Q&A at the end. Uh, we're getting close to our time, though. So quickly tell us, uh, Laura, let's start with you on this one. What do you think are the most pressing challenges that we see or you may see in achieving this quote unquote, novel innovation wave. Laura, over to you. Thanks. So with the growth of AI usage and patenting, I think we're already seeing a number of challenges arise. And I think there's um, already a lot of hard work underway to prioritize and address them. And one of the big challenges here is making sure that patent examiners around the world receive up-to-date technical training on emerging technologies like AI so that they are in the best position to examine patent applications. Uh, and this is particularly important because um, AI patenting doesn't just mean patenting the models themselves, it also includes patenting applications of AI in other fields. So the examiner may be the expert in that other field, but not in AI. And I think we're coming to a point where the majority of patent examiners will be AI examiners. So I think it's a really pressing challenge that we come up with a way to make sure patent examiners have an understanding of AI. And one other challenge to briefly mention um, relates to the growth of connected devices. Um, I think we're gonna have a lot of new entities entering the digital space who may be relatively new to it these entities are going to need to identify the patents that they need to license in order to implement standardized connected uh, communication technology if it's not already licensed. And I'll say these are complicated issues for people who deal with it on a daily basis. So for those who are new to it, I think it's really important to make sure we're doing what we can to streamline that process for them to make sure they have visibility into the necessary IP and they have clarity on what the terms to license it will be. And I'll stop there uh, and sensitive to time. Thanks, Laura. Brett, let's ask you the same question. The most pressing challenges that you see in achieving this novel innovation wave. I, I think it's a cultural shift. Um, you have you know, very different technologies that are all kind of merging in some sense around, you know, bigger, faster compute resources, more distributed resources. There's a lot more happening at the edge than there used to be. Everyone used to be focused on cloud, but now we're seeing edge to cloud as an emerging, very important sort of enabling low latency technology. Um, you know, the, the storage is key, the, the, the networking as, as Laura had mentioned, whether it's local or global, is changing the way we work. Uh, so you've got this need to respect things like trade secrets, but they're becoming more and more difficult to respect as the information seems to be distributed everywhere, at home, at, you know, at work, um, over networks that are secure and insecure. So it's, it's getting challenging. So I, th I think we just have to start by recognizing the value of open fundamentals, um, sharing to, to sort of accelerate platforms and then very sort of uh, selectively refine what we care about to differentiate and monetize uh, in, in the marketplace. But I think it's, it's a cultural shift uh, is the biggest challenge for me. Thanks, Brett. Jason, over to you for the same one. The ch most pressing challenges that you see in achieving the novel innovation wave. Yeah, very briefly, um, I agree with what, what Brett and Laura said. I would just add that uh, it's, it'll be important to make sure that we have the right legal frameworks in place. Um, you know, it's, you know, one of the things that I think many of us remember is, is the days of when, uh, when software was really coming up and it was difficult 
in some places around the world to get protection, you know, patent protection for software. And this, I think, can affect um, the level of innovation and investment that you get in, in some areas. So I think we'll need to make sure that, that proper attention is paid to making sure that the legal framework that's in place is the right one that will that will encourage innovation and investment. And um, hopefully um, that will happen and, and we'll, we'll learn the lessons from, from the past. Great, thank you so much. I think we have four questions from the audience and we're going to make an attempt to uh, have all four answered by one of you. So we're gonna start with you, Laura. Uh, a question is, could you comment on how the pace of granting IPRs compares to the pace of innovation in the digital age? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's a hard question. Um, I, I think there's certainly a relationship between the two. I think there is an uptick in the, the grant of IPRs and digital technologies um, along with the uptick in innovation in the space. I think though we're seeing that overall in, in patenting in general. There has been a continued increase, I think during the pandemic, maybe a tiny slowdown, but with continued increase after that in, in the pace of seeking IP and, and the grant of it by global patent offices. So I'd say there's you know, a relationship between the two and you can certainly look to one to get a sense for the other. But especially in digital technologies, what I think we'll find is maybe a, you know, the time lag between the grant of the IP itself and the, you know, pursuit of it. Um, by the time it might get granted, things might have moved on. So I think there is, you know, you're dealing with a, a different kind of timeline when it comes to digital technologies, as you may in some pharmaceutical fields. So I would say it might be a looser connection for digital, um, but certainly it, it can be used as, a, as an indicator. Thanks, Laura. Uh, the second question, um, it's going to be for you, Brett. If IP protection duration can be reached or maybe reduced, not reached, the technologies can play a more fruitful role for developing nations. Is it possible or, or there exists IP barriers among advanced and developing nations? You're on mute, Brett. I'm sorry, I was the first one to do it today, or maybe the, maybe the second. Um, so I think it's a difficult question for sure. Um, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, and this is a bit of a, a, this is maybe coming out of left field a little bit, but I do think that 20 year terms are awfully long for software uh, ideas. And I think, I think also the amount of time necessary to examine those those uh, assets might be too long to be useful for many software developers. So they don't necessarily put as much reliance on software patents as maybe they, they might otherwise. Um, I, I do think that there's an opportunity there. Uh, this is the, the part that comes out of left field where we might think about the use of utility models, a little more sort of unexamined rights that could have shorter terms that could, that could accelerate the registration of ideas you know, very quickly, get them out there, get them published, speed up innovation through more publication, but without the burden of this uh, examination step in the front end. I, I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but it is a path to speeding up innovation. The problem with utility models is that they're often limited to structures and configurations and mechanical objects. That doesn't need to be the case if we decide it to be. So that's the first thing. And the other thing I'll mention is um, I think that there are uh, lots of alliances now that are allowing large and small, uh, I'm sorry, sort of more developed and maybe lesser developed countries to work together uh, to, to expedite uh, innovation, like the Low Carbon Patent Pledge, for example, uh, which uh, HPE, Microsoft, Meta, and others founded a couple of years ago and we're trying to like share technologies to speed the promotion and the encourage to encourage innovation everywhere and anywhere because these patents are everywhere as well it's not just limited to just the us so i think there's an age of alliances here that could really be leveraged to uh speed things up as well thanks brett uh question number three is for jason 
among the two things, ICT and the science field, which plays a bigger role in the production of new things, innovative, or technologies in this current situation, specifically during the pandemic period? Yeah, so I, you know, I'm not sure it's gonna be, it's really that easy to say which has played a larger role. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it partly it would depend on kind of, kind of how you look at things or, or, or measure things. But I, I certainly can say that I think there's, there's a great convergence going on and there and there's a great um, uh, you know advantage being taken of it, advancements in both areas. Um, you know, for example, I, I'm not sure it would have been possible to develop the vaccines that were developed um, in the pandemic period as quickly um, without the application of ICT technology to the work that was being done to develop the vaccines. Um, and I think you're going to see that more and more in you, you see the application of ICT technologies to um, di to di diagnosing things uh, much more quickly, to um, to sharing of, te of technology and sharing of, of information and data around the world. Um, so, you know, I, I really think this, the the great strength will come about through the convergence of the two, and and they're they're really they're very much interrelated. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, we are running out of time now. Uh, we want to move on to the to the next panel. So I want to thank, please uh, thank Laura and Brett and Jason. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you part of the panel. Thank you very much. And I will turn it back to Vanessa. Thank you to all the panelists and to Lisa Jorgensen as well for this really interesting discussion. We will now turn to the second panel. Um, which is dedicated to the deep science uh, wave. And this uh, panel will be chaired by In Florzak, Senior Vice President and Chief IP Counsel of 3M Innovative Pro Properties. In, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And welcome everyone to this first panel discussion on deep science, innovation wave and the role of intellectual property. As you have heard uh, from the previous speakers and their opening comments in the previous panel too, the deep science wave will, will evolve around breakthrough inventions and innovations in the fields of life science and health, in agri-food, in energy and clean technology, and in transportation. So this wave relates, this deep science wave relates to scientific progress across an array of scientific fields that I've discussed previously, and that have matured over the last decade and which are now erupting. For example, the, the, the clear example here is the evolution and the rapid development of mRNA vaccines. Now, like the digital age, the deep science wave has not arrived out of nowhere. Right, so breakthroughs in biotechnologies, in biochemistries, in nanotechnologies, in new materials, and other scientific advances made over the last decades have facilitated these downstream innovations, representing a true comeback uh, for the hard sciences. Taken together, this has led to a radical progress in fields as diverse um, as what I've enumerated before. Industri and uh, the links between science and industrial innovation and the marketplace has become even stronger rather than weaker. As you've heard, intellectual property has played a critical role, a critical role in the digital science age and now also in the science intensive deep science wave, uh, where novel innovation in these fields um, are, are, are needed. Now, similar to the information and communication technology sector, the most successful companies and organizations in this space have consistently made use of various forms of intellectual property, including patents, trade secrets, designs, and branding. So looking into the future, the question for this panel is how the future of this deep science innovation will impact the role of intellectual properties. So now let me uh, introduce this esteemed panel representing a diverse set of companies that contribute to the deep science innovation. Dan Ennebel from Cargill, Jillian Thackeray from Thermal Fisher Scientific, Jessica Asana from DuPont, and John Cheek from Tenneco. 
And they'll now discuss their company's industries and provide examples how their company's innovations are contributing to this deep science wave. So over to you, Dan. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us. Um, my name is Dan Anabo. I work with Cargill Incorporated. We're a large um, ag food uh, participant. And you know what we're seeing as we lean into the future and as we look at, at how science can solve humanity's problems, you know, our first goal, and I think our first focus always is, we have to find a way to feed the 900 million humans that are gonna go to bed hungry tonight. And that cannot be lost and that has to be job number one. But within that, as my colleague on this panel, Jillian, pointed out uh, when we were meeting a few days ago, um, that our past attempt, the Green Revolution, which did in fact feed 2 billion people who were underfed or not fed at all, um, that came with externalities. That approach uh, in agriculture came with externalities, pesticides, herbicides, et cetera. And so the challenge now is how do we unwind or roll back some of those negative externalities, water usage, land usage, pesticides, herbicides, while still feeding those 2 billion people we brought forward? And as I said earlier, how do we bring on that next billion people uh, that, that have a fundamental right to be fed, nourished, and healthy? Uh, and so that's really a lot of what food companies are looking at, ag companies are looking at, biotech companies. And there's going to have to be some give and take. There's no free lunch, uh, no pun intended, uh, when it comes to the innovations that will have to be uh, carried out to make this true. Uh, there is not a perfect um, system. There is not technology that will make everyone happy. Uh, but I think we have proven as an industry, we have proven uh, more broadly is, in humanity, we have risen to this occasion repeatedly and we have every confidence we'll do so again. The second big wave for ag food is is the is our ability to create um, sustainable and renewable non-food and fuel applications. So we can replace some of the polymer chains that would have come from non-renewable, non-sustainable sources such as petroleum, and we convert them into renewable polymers. We have polyurethane foams that are in car seats. We have additives that make asphalt 100% uh, renewable or, or, or recyclable in road surfaces, um, many things like that. And the third area of emphasis, I think, where technology is going to lead us forward in the ag food area is around sustainability. And I mentioned it a little bit, but but in particular, water usage, land usage, um, waste. So in fact, we actually produce enough calories to feed every person on the planet. We just can't get those calories to every person on the planet. So there's waste and, and supply chain logistic issues that are going to have to be innovated around. Um, and so I think that's really where the science is going to come. I think things like biotechnology, Molecular biology are going to continue to be an essential part of that future story. I know that makes some markets and some people uncomfortable, but I think it is, it is something we're going to have to find a win-win uh, for all the stakeholders. Um, and, and I believe that, you know, uh, continued um, developing of infrastructure in, in, in parts of the planet that have more um, arrogable land is going to be a big part of that too. So, so it's going to be a mix of technology, innovation, um, and, and frankly, government activity. Great. Great. Thank you, Dan. I'll pick up at this point. Uh, Jillian Thackeray from Thermo Fisher Scientific, as Ann mentioned. Um, Thermo Fisher serves a wide variety of customers and clients on everything from basic to applied scientific initiatives. For those of you who aren't familiar, um, we make everything from electron microscopes for sort of um, discoveries about the very molecular structure of things, um, down to lab chemicals, plastics, things that are used in everyday research or in um, uh, manufacturing of many products. And then we also do um, service and contract development for the pharmaceutical industry um, in the biotech industry, helping to support clinical trials and also manufacturing substances once drugs and other treatments are um, developed and approved. In this, it gives us a sort of interesting perspective across the industries because with academics, a lot of times we're supporting very basic scientific research into understanding life, how it works, how molecules work, um, how different materials can be used and developed. And a lot of that research is very open-ended to understand the science 
underlying things to then figure out what new applications there can be. We also serve a lot of startup small companies who are trying to develop new tools and new processes, new things to produce to help the world be cleaner, safer, and healthier. And then a lot of the end production where the more traditional measures of productivity come into play, I think, where we're looking at how can we get goods, manufacture goods that support the health and biotech industries, get them to consumers more efficiently at a lower cost, um, and do that in a way that has, as Dan referred to, fewer externalities. Um, so we're right at the breaking edge of a lot of this uh, deep wave of science, doing research in-house ourselves to understand better some of the tools and how they can be applied and what can be achieved with them, as well as working closely with our customers to understand what their needs are. What do they need their tools to be able to do? What scientific problems are they unable to address that if we were able to develop develop a different tool or refine an existing one, would they better be able to unlock the secrets of life? Um, it is a question where the, the point of this panel about productivity uh, is at a very fine point. How do you measure productivity increases when it relates to better quality of life, to less human suffering, to better treatment of disease? These are all things that are very much um, the objects of what the scientific companies like Thermo Fisher are trying to address, yet they are things that are not well measured by traditional economics in looking at productivity. I do think there's another contribution here in that over the last 50 years, the realm of what we as human beings understand about life has greatly expanded and the knowledge base now is quite extensive and it has been pointed out by academics that simply training to get to a basic level of being able to initiate new questions takes longer now because the, the, the material that anyone who is a student must learn in order to get to the edge of innovation, there's a much bigger body of material that they need to learn and that just takes longer. So one of the consequences of the great knowledge that we've developed as human beings is that it's taking longer for inventors to get to the point of the unknown and be able to invent something new. You see the average age of inventors is going up, uh, the average age of doctors, of other professionals who work on solving problems of human health is going up. One of the hypotheses is that we just have so much knowledge that it takes longer to learn it. Um, so this is a, a question again about productivity and how do we as human beings harness what we know in more efficient ways. Um, one of the previous panelists referred to the intersection of the digital and AI and software arts with the health and human science aspect. And I think that is key because we are still puzzling on figuring out how to use our great computing power to help ourselves unlock some of these mysteries of life that we know we have not figured out yet, but that we're not quite sure how to get there. And we really need assistance because it is more than our own brains can do. So I think that the great future um, benefit of this innovation, we are still uh, on the cusp of unlocking it in terms of productivity as well as human welfare. And we haven't quite yet achieved it. We're in the midst of an incredibly exciting time because of this, where we know there are things we could address and could solve better, but we really need to much continue using the existing tools and um, the benefits will hopefully be realized soon. I think, um, and you referred to the mRNA vaccines. This is an example that we can look at and hypothesize that there are more of those discoveries ready to happen. There was well over a decade of research into the use of messenger RNA to help create vaccines and therapeutics. That research had been academic as well as in companies, um, developing it, understanding it, perfecting it, figuring out how to use it without bad consequences, but to use it very effectively to achieve a necessary aim in short time. All of that research and work to get to the point of usability was put to the test with the COVID pandemic. And the good news is that human society passed with flying colors. A vaccine was developed in record time, I think five times quicker than any vaccine had ever been developed in the history of humankind. 
to address the COVID virus. And this was due to all of the accumulated knowledge, understanding, and experimentation with mRNA in the decade previous. I'm not sure that economics really captures the boost in human productivity from creating a vaccine so quickly, but surely it does show up in terms of better societies, fewer problems, healthier human population, not a setback in terms of uh, even greater illness and death than we've seen. And so that is an example of how our investment in this sort of science will pay off in terms of, I think, the productivity we all truly care about, which is human welfare. And I look forward to seeing what new examples like this evolve from our investment in the deep science wave. I'll now pass it to Jessica at DuPont. Thanks, Jillian, and uh, thanks all for inviting my participation in this uh, conference. Um, DuPont is a multi-industry company and, and has the essential innovations to thrive. We serve a, a wide variety of industries, automotive, building and construction, energy, um, government and public sector, military, um, law enforcement, and emergency response. Um, we have products that go into packaging and printing, safety and protection, and uh, water management. And uh, many of our, our brands are very well known. We have, uh, the, you know, in, in, in terms of public safety and protection, like the Kevlar brand, Nomex, um, Tyvek. So m many products that go into um, uh, the deep science field where technology solutions are based on overcoming um, substantial scientific or engineering challenges. <clears throat> And like I heard before in the previous panel, I'm an optimist. And I see that first, the public has a, a strong desire for sustainable products. And second, we all see a critical evaluation of the suitability of existing products that leaves unmet needs for innovation to fill. And, and this is a, a very um, exciting area for DuPont. Um, I am hopeful that the future of um, DuPont and other companies uh, like those represented here today um, and DuPont's sustainability goals reflect that we and our customers are on the cusp of an innovation wave created in response to sustainability, the global pandemic that was mentioned by Jillian and economic uncertainty. Um, our very purpose in DuPont, as I said prior, is to empower the world with essential innovations to thrive. And I, I might add to that, uh, that the market is exerting new pressures on producers and customers not only want the product to function as well as it ever did, but to meet new customer and regulatory expectations of sustainability and other ethical concerns. So meeting these, new, these needs require new and innovative approaches. Um, in response to these global challenges, the United Nations came out with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and DuPont sustainability goals are, goals are inspired by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And innovation is a strategic pillar uh, driving DuPont's meeting its 2030 sustainability goals to deliver the solutions uh, for global challenges and enabling a circular economy, innovating safer by design, clean water, personal protection, advanced mobility, high performance computing, high frequency connectivity like 5G, applied healthcare solutions relevant to longer life expectancy, um, important for the innovations, sustainable and productive construction and the internet of things. Um, so that kind of summarizes my introductory comments to the first question, and I'll turn it over to John. Hey, thank you, Jessica, and thank you to IPO and, and WIPO for organizing this event. It's, it's been fantastic so far. Um, so I am the uh, IP leader at Tenneco, which is a technology solutions provider primarily to the automotive um, sector. So we focus on uh, advancing global mobility uh, particularly uh, in terms of cleaner, more efficient, comfortable, uh, and reliable, reliable transportation. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to a couple of things for us. I, I would start by saying, uh, of course, we're not like some of the companies that 
uh, are here today, uh, a true, you know, kind of uh, scientific uh, based uh, company, right? We, we do applied science, we do some fundamental uh, scientific research, but in two areas that, that come to mind for me for, for this deep science wave of innovation is on clean power uh, and the, the evolution of fuels for power generation, um, in particular e-fuels uh, generated from clean electric energy uh, or in also hydro, hydrogen, which is a, another area where we're doing a lot of work uh, to, to, to really drive forward some advancements on reducing the carbon emissions when um, combustion occurs in a combustion-based power generation environment. Um, the other thing that, that we see in, in the mobility space is just the other emissions that occur during transportation, right? We have uh, emissions that need to be controlled and captured um, uh, around uh, tires and brakes and other things that today's transportation creates. Uh, and then the last thing we see, and this is not necessarily specific to our company, but lots of scientific uh, advancement on how we treat carbon that is generated in the world. Uh, how do we capture it? How do we uh, reuse it? How do we use it to, to form new things? Uh, on the mobility piece itself, I would um, I would mention the, the importance of enabling technologies and, and the scientific basis for them for autonomous vehicles and transportation that would be sufficient for humans to, to be in, right? We, as human beings, uh, react to the environments around us uh, and research going on into causation and, and uh, countering motion sickness uh, is a big element of this, uh, looking at the science uh, for just an autonomous vehicle, the similar issues for high-speed transportation where the human body will experience different things. Uh, and then looking for technical solutions that will allow the, the body to, to react normally uh, during that time. I think the point on um, linking the, the two innovation waves here is really critical. Um, uh, the other thing we see in the, the uh, mobility space is the importance of, of things like physics-based uh, predictive models uh, and the implementation of AI to do those to make um, failure of all these critical systems predictable. Um, right, so that's one linkage. Uh, and the other thing I think we'll need to be especially focused on is the pace of going from scientific breakthrough to technology solutions and products that are in the world solving people's real life problems. Um, and so as we see companies in the mobility and transportation and, and clean power space making breakthroughs, all of the innovation in the, the digital wave is really going to help speed those things to market which is important, and I think, to the, the, the points on productivity, right? The faster we can get scientific breakthroughs through a technology development cycle and into the real world, uh, the better we'll be. Uh, so I think we can't look at these separately. We need to look at them together uh, and, uh, you know, uh, see how that they can have some synergies between them to go faster. I'll stop with that. Back to you, Ann. Thanks, John, and thanks to the panelists uh, for you know talking about your companies and really to exemplify with clear-cut examples how each of the companies today are contributing through their innovation and inventions to this uh, deep science uh, wave. All right, like the previous panel, um, arguably one way to effectively drive to effectively drive this deep science wave, you know, in hopes of increasing productivity and economic growth and and as John mentioned, really ultimately for the well-being of our society is to enter into partnerships. And I know that from 3M's perspective during the, the, the pandemic, 3M had part, entered into partnerships like never before. Uh, we had literally over 2,000 partnerships came our way. Uh, I can't keep track of them now and trying to figure out how to really um, partner with other companies to really fight the pandemic. So now can you, each one of you, share examples of how your organizations and companies have entered into partnerships, particularly as it relates to leveraging your organization's intellectual property rights to further innovations in the health, agri-food, um, sustainability, and mobility fields. So this time around, we'll start with Jillian, and then we'll pass it on to Jessica, John, and then Dan. So over to you, Jillian. Yes, thank you. And yeah, I think it is an area where IP plays a critically important role. Um, you know, the role of IP is to um, document and secure 
property rights that arise out of this investment that companies or um, academics or individuals have made in terms of inventing something and coming up with something new and novel um, that will uh, have a, a useful purpose. And so I think it is um, critically important to have those rights in order to be able to facilitate partnerships. Um, we do, most of us live in capital market economies where companies are expected to have returns on their investment and to produce not only goods and services, but returns to their shareholders. And in order to do this, we need to be able to harness the inventions that our many scientists and employees come up with. Um, IP allows us to do that while at the same time disclosing it to others so that they can also build upon those um, ideas or inventions. And it does that through patents. It does that through agreements regarding the use of trade secrets if they're shared with partners. But these partnerships are critical because no one organization can do it all themselves or leverage the knowledge. We each have special skills and areas we've built out expertise in, and we need partners to help us advance that. For Thermo Fisher Scientific, we partner with academics in terms of basic science and a lot of the research they're doing in determining how to bring those to fruition as products for the marketplace. We also partner with our customers to figure out how to improve the services we offer or how to advance our tools such that our customers can better use them for the ends they need. And IP is a critical part here of helping to define the ownership rights, but also helping us to share ownership in order to advance joint interests. Um, it really is a critical uh, aspect, I think, of IP that it allows us to set out the definition of those rights, set out an understanding of um, who contributes what, and then advance the partnership between the entities in a way that allows us all to produce something better and good. In the case of Thermo Fisher, we've seen um, you know, a real growth of this in partnering with customers and also sometimes our competitors are also our customers where we work together to make better or different products for the marketplace using the skills or the um, uh, knowledge that each of us has to bring to the partnership. It really is a critical part of how we help advance science. And there are many um, inventions, I mean, the mRNA vaccines, another one as an example, where no one company or entity would be able to achieve the end by itself. It really takes a multiplicity of um, minds and also of skills, as Jessica referred to it, DuPont, different capabilities from different organizations in order to achieve the benefits and really realize what the deep science wave can do for us. And back to you, or if I'm not supposed to, I'm supposed to pass it to somebody else. Uh, Jessica, please. Thanks, um, Jillian, that was great comments. Uh, in DuPont, we collaborate with our customers to meet the needs we see in their markets. And these voluntary collaborations are very important. The right kind of collaborator with strong technical capability is going to ensure that the technology is taken in the right direction for regulatory compliance and public safety. Each product in a deep science company uh, presents different issues, both in terms of reaching the market technically and the regulatory issues presented, as well as the areas where IP rights garner the most benefit. To facilitate these partnerships, all types of IP rights, patents and trade secrets especially, are important on both sides of the table. And that ensures that we each can benefit and uh, benefit from, from our work together. I, I will say it can be complicated and difficult to draw the line between who owns what and how IP is shared. But if done well, all parties to the collaboration can succeed. And the and and the, our culture and our society will succeed from receiving better sustainable products. At DuPont, we have the invigorating challenge of a wide and exciting array of products, which offer solutions in a diverse range of markets, as I mentioned before. Um, and they enable sustainable development to foster human potential for generations to come, as many companies represented here do. Our markets reflect this, ranging, reflect this and it ranges from safety and protection. Um, uh, for example, the, the well-known Kevlar brand for human protection, and we partner with customers, um, for example, 
in producing uh, safe products like uh, um, um, hazmat suits and uh, um, masks for uh, you know uh, face masks, um, environmental environmentally sustainable building materials, um, electronics and automation for safety. Uh, um, clean water. We we have water filters that provide uh, not only um, you know enable us to provide. Uh, the water in the in the volume and of the quality that's needed for the future, and healthcare um, as well as renewable ener energy. Um, I, I think across all the panelists and and all the industries, our innovations are only limited by the creativity of our employees and our customers. And so, human capital is the most important piece of the innovation puzzle. Uh, on to you, John. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, I, I think partnerships are critical uh, for all of us, uh, of, of course, and and particularly in in the the space that I'm working in now with, you know, advancing you know new transportation models takes an army of people at different companies with different capabilities. Um, we we see a lot of opportunities for partnerships with our customers, uh, and that's really important. Uh, but it does highlight something that is very interesting in this space, which is predicting who those customers are going to be and who's going to be the provider of transportation uh, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, will it be the companies that we all think of today, right? If, if we drive in a, in a passenger car, right? We'll get into a car. We know the brands of those companies. But as mobility evolves, who is going to be providing the solution, right? What is the brand that is going to be the solution for not a driver, but a rider, uh, of course. And so, Partnering with emerging potential customers is a really important um, opportunity uh, to consider uh, and how you bring different IPs uh, portfolios together uh, to help those emerging uh, customers uh, be successful while also uh, you know, sustaining the development that's going on with the existing uh, customers that you partner with is a really win-win opportunity if you can put the, the IP together um, we tend to think about it. Uh, there's a book um, from maybe 25 plus years ago called Coopetition. And, and it's really about how competitors or quasi competitors can collaborate to not just get a bigger piece of the pie, so to speak, but make the pie bigger for everyone and make the outcomes better for society. Uh, so those customer partnerships are, are critical uh, understanding and, and leveraging you know, a predictable IP system uh, as we go into those relationships and, and make investments is, is really important. Uh, but university and government uh, partnerships are, are critical, right? Universities tend to have, in our experience, better access to the leading uh, scientific researchers. They have better access to certain types of government funding. And government itself uh, can really be a great partner, um, right? The, the social benefits of what we're trying to accomplish are really meaningful uh, and the governments around the world themselves have deep science exper expertise in their government labs. Uh, and so to the extent you can leverage the right um, in a matrix of, of partnerships, bringing the IP in a, in a different way, perhaps to the different partners with different needs um, can be really valuable. Uh, and so, you know, I think that, you know, we, we can't see this as a you know, one size fits all way to handle the IP in the business. We need to, to think about um, you know, how the, the laws and, and the regulations and the portfolios we build all play together to make the right solution for customer partnerships, the right solution for academic partnerships, and the right solution for government partnerships so that we can get all the pieces together to, to make you know, this new wave of mobility actually come to life for people in a real way. And on to you, Dan, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dan. Uh, probably similar to others, um, cargo takes a customer back approach to innovation, right? So we start with customer needs, and that requires a lot of collaboration. And you can think of the layers of customers. Sometimes our customers are other large multinationals who ultimately serve end consumers. Sometimes customers are end consumers. Sometimes customers are startups that are trying to disrupt the marketplace. So, but we always start with that in mind: who's going to use the product? Who's going to benefit from the product? Um, 
And that's where we start. And that requires a lot of collaboration, a lot of insight, and a, and a lot of different actors. Um, I agree with everything the prior panelists had said, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat them, although I could and they would apply to us as well. Uh, what I will do is take a little bit of my time to share two um, two hopefully supportive uh, tangents to the topic. One is, is to go a little more granular. And the agriculture and food space has historically, to the extent it's used intellectual property, has been heavily um, a heavy user of trade secrets and less of a user of patented technology. Um, but we've seen over the years as cargo continues to move up the innovation scale um, that collaboration actually works better when the, the when the partners have patent positions. It, 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 we learned early on in a very large joint venture with, with a global seed company that they were able to collaborate with us in an open and transparent way uh, because their technology was already documented, already protected. They knew what they were contributing and there was legal protections around what they were contributing. And, and it was harder for cargo to fully engage them because so much of what we valued and so much of what we were bringing to the table was know-how or trade secrets. And you know, one uh, incidental or accidental disclosure could destroy great value for us. And I think we've taken that learning to heart. So to the extent that the patent system gets a bad rap as somehow slowing innovation in the modern world, our experience in ag food is the opposite. It can be a great facilitator, a great equalizer, a great clarifier uh, that allow people to come together and have meaningful, important conversations to achieve the kinds of innovation outcomes that the panel is talking about. So, so that's one observation I would share. The obser other observation I would say, share is, is similarly supportive of the patent system. I believe there are times where people are going to say in areas like sustainability, um, patents maybe aren't appropriate because sustainability is such a fundamental human uh, import at this time. Uh, but I push back a little bit on that, right? I mean, imagine the global a global food chain that can feed seven, eight, nine billion people. Imagine how big that is. Imagine how much capital it takes to create that much food to feed that many people, right, in a sustainable manner. We have to attract that capital. We have to reward that capital. So it, participants in this industry, participants in this innovation chain, participants who bring sustainability and water use or land use or uh, renewable fuels, there has to be a way for that capital to get recognized and rewarded. Um, and and so I think it's, it's less about no patents in the sustainability space and more about um, key innovations in sustainability spaces being made openly available that they're not being used as some preferential way to allow Cargill to win while our competitors don't, but rather that as Cargill or other companies bring innovations to the world that make a, a better, safer, more sustainable planet, that those that, that there is a vehicle through some type of a open royalty, you know, friend, uh, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory licensing. There are ways where you can make that technology available where the innovator and their vast capital investments are rewarded and incented to continue to invest that capital. Um, while still making the benefits of those widely and openly available to all of humanity. So those are just two perspectives I would add to the power of IP uh, in bringing forward that next generation um, of, of essential technology. Thanks uh, to the panelists for that, those great insights. You know, as we talk about, uh, as I reflect about our conversation here and talk about partnerships, I mean, not all partnerships are successful, right? Not all things that we go into are successful, but the fact that we are doing more of them and are more open to doing them, and the fact that we have intellectual property to do them um, increases our chances of really driving this, this deep science um, um, wave. The other thing I would say is you've heard the panelists talk about the importance of having disclosure. And those disclosures typically come through patents because why we really need to understand as we go through partnerships, who, who owns what, that clarity that Laura Sheridan talked about upfront. And when we come together and do things together, who owns what is, is of utmost importance uh, to the, the parties that are, are collaborating and having intellectual property rights such as patents or clear definitions of what trade secrets are, are really, really helpful to establishing that front end ownership. All right, so in the few minutes that we have left here, um, I just want to ask the panelists in, in a bit of a lightning round here, right, in order to set up, in order for, for your companies to set up an opportunity to increase this likelihood of, the, of having a, a deep science wave innovation that really produces the scientific breakthroughs that we need in betterment of productivity, our society, 
what do your organizations need? It's kind of an open-ended question, but what, what do you really need? What does this audience need to understand? And that's obviously which is not just your companies, but this is going to hold through for, for many other companies. So we'll start with Jessica, then go to John, and then Dan, and then Jillian. So over to you, Jessica. Yeah, thanks, Ian. And I, I really appreciate this question because I think uh, we can all debate, you know, the specific laws around um, like patent term and speed of prosecution. But there, I think there are some important policy um, or business recommendations for a deep science company uh, with challenges requiring lengthy research and development and large capital investment before successful commercialization. Um, and, um, and these are global consistency of IP laws and predictability of intellectual property protections and enforcement. And I'll mention here, especially including uh, trade secrets and know-how. Um, and, and that means that includes tools for gathering evidence. And as Brett mentioned um, earlier in the first panel, the technology and laws to actually improve trade secret security. Because as uh, you know, we, we grow into a more open environment, we have a more open um, environment and uh, you know, people can access trade secrets, security is, is more important. A lot of the innovations driven by sustainability goals are of necessity going to be process related, at least in my view. And this is both new and improved processes as we turn to new and greener feedstocks and production environments. We want to use less power, less water, and less fuel for carbon footprint. Uh, similar products made better and cleaner are going to be important. Often the most effective form of IP protection for these things is trade secrets and know-how. I will uh, also add in conclusion that the need for sustainability promotes innovation leaders since you know, the Me Too followers won't be able to copy the old products. On to you, John. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I think for me, three things come to mind, and, um, and, and I think you know, we're all saying a lot of the same things uh, in, in principle, but the predictability of, of an IP system, whether it, it's you know, the way you know, a particular company would want it to be or uh, opposite the way they would like it to be, predictability is critical for attracting uh, and rewarding investors. Uh, and, and as Jessica mentioned, right, the, a lot of the activity here is very capital intensive. We need to have capital invested to, to make these solutions come to life. Uh, the other thing I think is really critical is in a continuing the push on education around the world about intellectual property, uh, how the system works, how it's intended to work, um, you know, debunking myths that people may have heard about, um, uh, and making sure that as a society, everyone understands the positive impact that a well-managed IP system can, can have for society. And then lastly, I think this goes to the, the notion that trade secret is going to be critical here, patents uh, maybe take the, the limelight, but as we see more and more um, criticality of trade secrets, finding the right balance uh, on employee mobility and protection of that information is going to be critical, right? And we, you know, we see uh, from time to time swings to either extreme, right? Uh, no limitations on employee mobility that puts a lot of secret information at risk or, you know, unfettered limitation on employee mobility that makes, you know, learning and sharing uh, and movement of people with these scientific skills um, difficult. So striking that right balance uh, that give employees the ability to, to, to be mobile, move and change jobs and advance uh, their knowledge and share in different industries, while also ensuring that those companies and individuals that invest in uh, funding this activity uh, are not going to lose it as it walks out the door if there is no uh, limitation uh, uh, that's meaningful, at least, uh, in terms of uh, preventing that leakage. Uh, on to you, Dan. Thank you. I agree with a lot of what was just said. You know, obviously, the overarching message, right? Sustainable, predictable methods for protecting human creativity, I think, is, is critical across the board. And then food, egg food is no different there. Um, I think it becomes more important as we go forward in egg food. 
the complexity of the solutions that are going to feed the next billion people while driving down water usage, driving down pesticide and herbicide usage, restoring uh, agricultural land, uh, the complexity of those solutions is going to require so many different people from so many different entities um, to really get us across the goal line. Um, we need a system where there is understanding and boundaries about whose contributions are what and how those contributions are acknowledged, recognized, and rewarded. And so I think the IP system is, is an important part of that. Um, I think the third thing for uh, for the ag food industry, I think we need the the um, our broad stakeholder um, uh, space to better understand the nature of food and the finance of food. Um, you know, oftentimes there are innovations that have been useful in pharmaceuticals or in for, uh, useful in petrochemicals or elsewhere that could be applicable to food and could could really move the needle for food production and, and feeding the world. Um, but there's these expectations of, well, a 30% royalty. It's like, we have businesses that, that move, you know, billions of tons of food to billions of people that are making three, four, five percent profit margins. And so I think it's so a one one barrier we do have at times is the innovation community that I think is used to working with traditional farm and other high margin businesses or big tech, I think doesn't understand the the fiscal reality of feeding this many people and how many people in the world you know feed their families on two dollars a day uh and so i think that that will also help streamline things as people begin to understand when they bring their cutting edge r d to the food space they have to reset their their financial expectations to make it viable to be able to extend the benefit um to the vast majority of of, of um humanity Yes, thank you. I think I agree with most of the comments made, and I think the very wise comments by my fellow panelists here. The the predictability, the stability, um, the the rule of law is really an essential thing that underpins a lot of what we do, and a lot of what enables our companies to share transparently and to work together. Um, I think it's critical the role that WIPO does, also as well as other organizations, in attempting to help simplify and harmonize these rules to the extent possible. Um, there's a lot of countries in the world and a lot of different entities and the complexity there alone could bring a lot of efforts down simply because it takes energy to navigate it one's way through. So the role of organizations like WIPO in helping to streamline and simplify um, it's certainly important for countries to be able to distinguish themselves to extent a, a certain regime is important to that country for policy reasons, but there's a lot of other ways that we can simplify and harmonize how IP is protected that helps to enable these collaborations that oftentimes are not only across industry lines or across lines between industry and academia, but also are multinational. There are many smart people around the world, and we really need to be able to harvest the benefits of all those minds and all those um, ideas, creativity, the ways that different people from different backgrounds may see different solutions or different opportunities. Um, and that stable, predictable system that is as simple as possible is a critical part of enabling that. Um, there was a question in the comments about um, the main difficulties in partnerships between academics and uh, commercial enterprises. And I would say, I, I think the, the uh, only one that sort of rises is sometimes a difference in the aims in that um, academics are often more focused on a pure question of interest and commercial enterprises have naturally a commercial interest. And so understanding that those parties may come from different positions, it does not mean there has to be a conflict, but one has to understand that sometimes the the ends and the 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 interests of the parties may differ and once you understand that you can talk about it transparently and figure out how to best meet the needs of both parties the same is true in any um collaboration i think that it advances science understanding the interests of the different parties and being transparent about that and having predictable rules so that we understand what we're likely to end up with where things are going to go all of those are critical to fueling these partnerships that help us really harness the um, promise and potential of the deep science wave. Back to you, Ann. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jillian. And thank you to the four uh, panelists here for your insightful comments. It's always um, nice to have a diverse set of views on, on what these companies need and, and others need to really drive this deep science innovation wave, which I think we would all agree on 
not only in this panel, but in general, what we need to increase the productivity the, and the economic efficiency. And ultimately, really, it's about um, increasing the, the life of, of our society, the wellness of our society. So let me, uh, let me thank the panelists again. I'm sorry that we're not, uh, with four panelists, we are not able to take time um, at this time to take further questions for these panelists but we look forward to participating in future events to continue this really important um, issues. And with that, I'll turn it back to the white boat uh, organizers. Um, Sasha, floor is yours. Thank you very much for in and um, to all the panelists of panel one and to two. Uh, we're almost at the end um, of this very interesting um, workshop. Uh, we have um, concluding remarks um, that will finalize um, you know, this important event. And I would like to ask um, Jessica uh, Landacre uh, to take the floor, um, and then um, Karsten Fink, uh, who's the chief economist at WIPO. Uh, Jessica, uh, why don't you go first? Thank you, Sasha, for your uh, kind introduction, and thank you to you and your team who, for, for all you've done to help coordinate the event. I am delighted to make closing remarks on behalf of Intellectual Property Owners Association. Uh, let me start by thanking the World Intellectual Property Organization and Assistant Director General Marco Aleman for partnering with IPO to put on this event. WIPO's Global Innovation Index is an important tool for examining the current state of in innovation and predicting the future of innovation. I also want to thank USPTO Director Kathy Vidal for taking time out of her schedule uh, to join us in kicking off the event. She is dedicated to inclusive innovation, and as she mentioned, today she is participating in the USPTO's We Wednesday, a program dedicated to supporting and encouraging women entrepreneurs. IPO applauds her leadership. We uh, believe that inclusive innovation and innovation-driven growth go hand in hand. Um, we appreciated the director taking time on such an especially busy day to be with us. I would also like to thank WIPO Deputy Director General Lisa Jorgensen for moderating our first panel today. And finally, I wanna thank our experts and IPO board members for sharing their very interesting insights into the connection between intellectual property and uh, innovation. Uh, the 2022 Global Innovation Index asks the question, is stagnation here to stay or are we about to enter a new era where innovation waves reinvigorate economic growth and productivity, productivity globally? On balance, today's event gave hope to the idea that innovation can and is reinvigorating economic growth. Notwithstanding pessimistic forces like COVID-19 pandemic and geopolitical events, there is cause for optimism. We heard from a broad cross-section of industries about how their companies are helping to solve the world's challenges. We even heard that global partnerships and collaborations are at the heart of recent innovations and that intellectual property was an important part of the equation. While IP is used in different ways by different industries to identify solutions to world problems, the key to innovation is a reliable and effective intellectual property system. Radical and scalable innovation takes time, but it also takes investment, and investment relies on the predictability offered by the intellectual property system. A related and interesting phenomenon is the convergence of industries working together. Digital and deep science are becoming more interconnected to solve global problems. They may leverage IP in different ways, but the IP system is key to the progress that is being made. To ensure the future of innovation, we need a high functioning intellectual property system that allows different industries and competing companies to enter into partnerships with the confidence that their inventions will be protect protected. Uh, IPO recognizes the need for better public understanding about the role that intellectual property system plays in driving innovation. WIPO's Global Innovation Index report contributes to a better awareness and understanding of global innovation productivity, and conferences like this are so important for improving public understanding about the role IP plays in the innovation ecosystem. 
IP education is a priority for IPO. I hope you will visit our website at IPO.org and the Affiliated Education Foundation website, IPOEF.org, to view the many educational resources we have linked, including webinars, toolkits, and tutorials. Again, many thanks to WIPO for inviting IPO to partner with you and discuss the role that IP plays in innovation. And thank you to our excellent speakers today. And finally, thank you to the audience for taking the time to listen. I look forward to our next conversation. Be well. And um, thank you again. Um, with this, I, I pass the floor to, um, to Carson Fink, Chief Economist, who's uh, reflecting a little bit on how uh, what we heard uh, today, um, you know, um, how that might determine um, our future, you know, economic research agenda, or you know, as as uh, as compared to uh, our previous reports, you know, what what today, uh, what new facts uh, emerge today, and how they might be reflected in our on our future work. Thank you, Sasha. And let me also um, start by thanking our partners in uh, this endeavor, in particular the IPO, for having uh, co organized this uh, event uh, with us. Uh, and of course, big thank you to all the contributors uh, who I think made uh, really interesting uh, remarks. Uh, I followed uh, the discussions quite, quite closely. What, what really strikes me as, as interesting about all of this, uh, you know, many of the um, um, panelists who talk today, you know, arguably are people who are quite close to technological progress, you know, working for, for companies that, you know, really are at the cutting edge of technological progress. And, you know, in a way, it's, it's good to get a sense uh, of, of optimism. And I think, you know, that was the, the you know, overwhelming uh, feedback that I think we, we believed. Um, and to be very frank, that contrasts, uh, you know, I think quite visibly, we've had similar events with economists. And I think you also just have to follow, you know, what uh, some of the prominent uh, innovation economists, macroeconomists uh, are writing. And, uh, you know, that tends to be um, much more pessimistic. Uh, now, you know, one could, of course, argue that selection bias, maybe, you know, people who are innately more pessimistic end up being economists. Uh, economists, there's a reason it's called the, the dismal sign, uh, signs. But more seriously, I think economists, of course, tend to look at the productivity numbers that class outlined at the beginning, and those do paint a picture of declining economic productivity. At least in advanced economies, it's it's different uh, in in the developing world. That's real. That's important, and that's having a profound implication. That's having profound implications on 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 how uh, economies work. Having said this, and I don't want to go too much into this. These are closing remarks, but I would say that also the thinking of economists on this topic has very much evolved, and I think more recently. You know, there has been a rethinking of economic growth models in the economics prof um, 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 profession, where it's perfectly um, um, plausible to have, on the one hand, rapid rates of technological progress, but increasingly more modest productivity and overall economic growth. I think this has to do with factors. In fact, one factor was, was already mentioned in the discussion that we, of course, already have a huge knowledge space a huge huge knowledge stock and building on this is is of course you know becoming progressively more um challenging now why is this this debate important i think it's important we can't really predict the future opportunities for technological progress are ultimately determined by the laws of nature nature um, the danger of making prediction is that there is an inherent bias in simply extrapolating the latest technological uh, technological trends. Um, historically, that's in a sense, um, you know, uh, not how technological progress has happened. Uh, technological uh, progress often comes in waves, and it's driven by breakthroughs that open up new paths for progress and often you know these breakthroughs are not necessarily predictable 
Um, I still think this debate on future innovation driven growth matters, you know, even if we can't change the laws of nature and can't really predict the path of technological progress in the long term, which technological opportunities are realized at any given point is still something that comes down to human choices. And it's important to ask, are our policies and institutions still working in making sure that opportunities for technological progress are realized? Uh, and that has many dimensions. Um, I think one thing um, that uh, is, is, is often looked there, there's a lot of attention being paid, uh, you know, what is the rate of inno innovation? How much do we invest in innovation? But we published a report last year, part of our World Intellectual Property Report uh, series that also highlighted how important the direction of innovation is. It, it doesn't only matter in a sense how much money we invest in, in innovation, it also matters a lot in which fields uh, innovation happens and technological progress uh, takes, takes, um, takes place. Of course, the intellectual property system plays an important uh, role in, 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 in making sure that the breakthroughs uh, are introduced in the marketplace. And in addition to the, to the points that were made about the intellectual property system, let me add one, which is that the IP system is really a market-driven um, um, system and it works in a rather decentralized way. And that, for example, during the COVID crisis was, was, was evident in a sense that, you know, there were many um, responses to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that, you know, at the outset were not maybe entirely obvious. Uh, you know, they were obvious in the case of vaccines. Uh, but I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the intellectual property system was there the intellectual property system is a technologically neutral system and it doesn't pick winners, but whatever the innovation is, the intellectual property system is there to incentivize it. Um, of course, the intellectual property system alone is not sufficient. We need continuous investments in the science sector. We need public investments um, to, in, into promising technologies that are still far away from being commercially viable. If I could just you know, um, point to one example that recently gained a lot of attention, nuclear fusion technology, which is highly promising. It could be the basis you know, for a future um, wave of technological progress, but there's still lots of barriers to be overcome before this technology can be used to generate energy on a large scale and, and is cost uh, effective, uh, even though there already, I think, is some, some significant private investment into that. Final point I'd like to make, the US innovation ecosystem is still central for the world in realizing opportunities for technological uh, progress. In the Global Innovation Index, the United States quote unquote, only ranks uh, second. And arguably also, um, innovation is happening in more and more economies around uh, the world. Um, but, you know, in the case of the GI, the GI is a relative ranking where we normalize innovation performance by the size uh, of economies. And of course, the US is one of the largest economy in the world. But also historically, US innovation if efforts, both at the scientific level and at the company level, have really been instrumental in driving technological adva advancement around the world. So the US is, of course, a key player in the global innovation ecosystem. And from WIPO's perspective, we are really grateful for opportunities such as today's to interact with key stakeholders in the US innovation system to better understand what's ahead, to better understand what are the needs of innovators and how the intellectual property system can contribute to that. With these remarks, let me thank again um, all the contributors to the event. Let me, let me thank, uh, of course, my colleagues, Sasha wunsch vincent and uh, Vanessa Behrens, uh, who uh, really did the hard work uh, on our side uh, in organizing uh, this event. Uh, of course, also um, um, I'd like to thank uh, Marco Aleman and uh, uh, Lisa Jorgensen, who are part of our senior management team for having supported this event and having uh, contribute, uh, contributed to that. Uh, 
so thanks a lot for that. Um, let me stop here and turn, uh, give you the back the mic, uh, Sasha. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karsten. And um, well, this is the end of um, of our workshop. So thanks to to all of you, and um, um, all the best and luck to uh, all the uh, participants around the world that followed us. And uh, see you soon. Bye bye.